Perspectives with Asima Silva from our studios right here at the People's Channel. And we've been talking, if you were with us last week, you know that we have been talking to Evan and to Chris, and that they not only, both of them from uh, from Wachusett, and Evan, congratulations on just graduating, uh, but they both went to this International Science Fair where they competed. And what we're going to do today is we're going to drill down a little bit deeper. We're going to find out exactly what these projects were. So they, they competed against 70 other students from Wachusett. Then went on to the to the state level, and then on to the international. What was it? Four hundred at the yeah, state yeah, level. Yeah, four hundred. Wow! And then on to uh, the international competition with uh, other students from over eighty countries that were there in uh, Pittsburgh, and they're here today to tell us a little bit uh, about those projects that brought them all the way to that competition in Pittsburgh, and we'll find out how they did as well. Oh yes, yes. So we forgot to ask you last week. Um, exactly at the international fair, how did you how did you place? So I didn't I did not place for a specific award at the uh, international fair. I what about the state? The state I came in uh, third overall. Oh wow! Very impressive. Uh, yes. Again, out of four hundred people, that's in, uh, that's incredible. Thank you. Uh, at the international fair, I got a third place award. Wow. Now, how are the categories at the international? So when you get a third place win, are there, th there's multiple categories? How is that set up? Yeah, so they, um, uh, what, what's different about the international fair compared to the state and regional levels is that they award by category. So they separate it into about 20 categories ranging from robotics all the way to animal science, which was the category that I was in. Um, yeah, and so there's the best of category and then second, third, and fourth place. Wow. All right. Uh, where are the, the fruit flies that brought you to this third place? Do you still have them? I guess their lifespan is very short, but they brought you to third place. They did indeed. Yeah, I have them still at the lab at UMass. Probably not the same exact flies that uh, were involved in the research, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> They're <descendants. laughs> All right, I continue. All right, so tell us about this. If you weren't with us last week, uh, you've been studying the fruit flies. You actually began this project in your living room. You quickly uh, moved it to, to, to UMass, where it continues to this day. Yep. Yeah, so basically from the outset, I knew the summer going into my sophomore year um, that I wanted to kind of endeavor to do something that had some semblance of application to the human system. Uh, and so one of the major problems that I noticed was that infertility rates were rising. We'd seen the um, global rate of infertility hit all-time highs in three consecutive years, which is the first time that that had happened on record. Um, perhaps more concerning than that, though, is the fact that it seems that every dietitian has their own miracle fix to the condition, uh, the vast majority of which include things like low and non-fat dairy products, um, which basically puts them at odds with the majority of the uh, scientific and medical community, which would actually assert that the opposite is most conducive uh, to healthful conception. And so I wanted to see if I could model that little dietary niche in an organism of my own. Uh, and so I chose Drosophila melanogaster, the common fruit fly, um, for a number of reasons. The first of which is its genetic similarity to humans, so they share um, about 50% plus of genetic material with humans. Um, but what I was more interested in, um, like I said last week, was just about the, the mechanisms by which they maintain the integrity of their genome. And so what I mean by that is how they protect against damage from happening. Because oogenesis, or egg building in general, um, is most commonly threatened by these small mobile genetic elements called transposons, which can move independently of the rest of the DNA code um, and inflict what are called double strand breaks. Um, but thankfully for both flies and our system, we have these small non-coding RNAs called pi RNAs that basically only exist to suppress that transposition um, and save us from the DNA damage that would otherwise kind of um, intrinsically uh, prove deleterious to our, our genome. And so basically what I did was create a, like a, a, um, a dairy supplement for my flies to kind of have them uh, intake. And so what I found that was really interesting was that not only did um, high fat consumption boosts fertility in the first generation of flies, but without consuming any kind of dairy additives whatsoever, the second, third, fourth, and fifth generations also um, replicated that same exact trend. So there was something that was being inherited on a transgenerational basis. Um, and so then to investigate that further, I dissected, um, stained, and then imaged on a confocal microscope the ovaries of like hundreds of the flies that I'd initially tested. Um, and at that point, I found some, some interesting things with respect to um, how they were producing eggs. And then after that, um, I used next generation sequencing, so like RNA sequencing, which is basically where uh, you extract tissue from the fly ovary. Um, and you can use that to kind of map the, the transcriptome, which is basically how those pi RNAs 
are being expressed. And so from there, you can kind of link exactly what you saw with respect to nutritional intake uh, all the way to the molecular level in terms of how they're actually protecting their DNA against damage. So, so what I learned from this yes. is women should have milk chocolate. Well, <laughs> I, I was just going to say, so infertility, I think they're brilliant. It's brilliant. It's, I, it's, a, great it's, a, great it's actually, exactly. it's a great marketing campaign. I can see it now. So infertility, which has been uh, going up, rising three years in a row. So it can be combated through diet. Uh, are we see, is this a worldwide phenomenon, or is this in certain countries or certain parts of the world? Yeah, it's certainly exacerbated by um, different conditions. This is definitely controlling for factors. Um, like genotoxic stress, so like smoking and things like that. But aside from that, yeah, it, it is definitely a global trend. Um, and so, so if, if, it's, if it's things like, like smoking, so for example, if we took Worcester, would Worcester have a higher infertility rate because uh, food deserts in the, in the city of Worcester, or it's harder for people to get nutrition, or more young people in particular smoke in urban areas than, say, in, in, in Holden or in the Wachusett area. Do we see it even localized in, in America or even here in central Massachusetts? I think it's tough to generalize because I think that um, what predominantly affects fertility isn't necessarily how much you're eating, but kind of what you're eating. Um, I think that the the biggest way to kind of demonstrate that is the misconception that I, that I discussed earlier with respect to uh, low and, and high fat dairy products. Um, See, I told you, milk chocolate. So yeah, there you that's, go. Yeah. So that's really all you. <laughs> that's, that's, all. that's really all you need. Yeah. I guess I mean I really was wondering if the uh, if that sort of that twenty four hour store where you go in and you're just microwaving everything uh, could that have an, an impact uh, on. I, I mean, it can certainly have an impact on your physique, but can it, could it have an impact on what you're studying? Yeah, so I mean, definitely I think that there, there's a fine line between opting for full fat products as opposed to the non-fat ones, and definitely I think obesity um, negatively impacts fertility. That's already been demonstrated in numerous studies. Um, but I think that what I found was that um, nutrition is definitely uh, inherently tied to the way that your genome operates. And I think the most important takeaway is that not only does it impact your fertility and potentially um, how your body is able to function, but there are repercussions that span uh, multiple generations. And I think that's the really exciting part about studying epigenetics. When you said you were dissecting and looking into the fly's ovaries, yeah. uh, you weren't doing that at home. You were that doing that at UMass? At yeah. <laughs> OK. I was going to ask, how were you doing that at yeah, home? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would have been definitely difficult to do in my living room. <laughs> I just, it, no, I don't know. I, could see where you would have just set up the lab and said, please, yeah. <laughs> operating now, <laughs> sterile, uh, sterile environment. Hey, listen, let me ask you a, a, a really dumb question. These fruit flies are really small. No, that's definitely not a dumb question. How that's are you doing one this? that I yeah. probably got from okay. every single judge <laughs> that I had this year. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it definitely took a ton of practice. I think that um, it was probably like a number of days in the lab just kind of working with flies and the the really fine instruments that you have to use to actually um, you know, conduct that protocol before I actually got the hang of it. I definitely wasn't a natural at, at fly dissection. Yeah, so. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Okay, so where do you go from here? Was this just for the science project and for the international, and now you have third place? Fantastic. Uh, congratulations Thank on you. that. And now you're going to continue with, with, with that, and there is a way in which you, know, you will help reverse this trend here in the, in the world, or you're on to, to other things? Yeah, so I'm still in the lab this summer um, working on the, the same project that I have been. Um, in, in terms of an endpoint, I think it's just I'm really interested in kind of elucidating the various ways that, that nutrition is tied to, to, how our, um, to how inheritance occurs across generations. Uh, in terms of in college, what I'll be studying, I'm still really interested in, in pi RNA um, and the, the interaction that they have with the mobile genetic elements that I discussed. So anywhere that I can um, kind of continue researching that phenomenon, I'd be really excited. So are there people out there who can just eat all the pizza and fried chicken and drink <laughs> all the Mountain Dew they want and it just won't affect them? As long as they don't become too fat. Yeah. And, and, and as long as they yeah. have chocolate. Yes. There you go. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I think that um, the... The epigenome of each individual person is, is so different that I think it's tough to kind of um, say, like, this is, this is a healthy fertility profile. Um, but yeah, huh. I think it varies. Huh. Yeah, Jenny Craig's going to have to take another look. I, I, yeah. I <laughs> well, but there is sort of, yeah, right, there is this whole industry that is, that is out there that is based on sort of these, these generalities. 
And I, I think if I, if I understand what, what you're saying correctly, a lot of that may just not matter. It may just be sort of the way that you're, that, that, that you're built. It's true. I think that a lot of what we get caught up in is, is kind of the lean diet and, and being as small as possible and thinking that that's going to um, be conducive to reproductive output. Um, but I think that there are just a lot more factors implicated than just that one thing. And I think that fertility is not as binary as we think. Um, and I think that the whole, the whole aspect of, of studying epigenetics extends not only to uh, fertility. I kind of want to make that clear. It's, it's like looking at how um, these pyRNAs are expressed has been used as uh, early biomarkers for cancer. Um, and then also in addition to that, different neuro, uh, neurodegenerative disorders as well. So it, it's something that has a, a wide range of applications. Well, yeah, but we'll before we, huge range. Yeah, I was going to say, but before we move on to Chris, so, so on that, but diet, is there a, a connection then to, to, to cancer, and is that part of what you're, what you're seeing? Uh, so not necessarily. I, I myself haven't personally studied mm -hmm. cancer, um, but just pyRNA expression isn't always studied um, with respect to, to diet as an as a, um, independent variable. Um, people often just look at how pyRNAs are inherently expressed in, uh, in, in humans and see if that could be kind of a predictor uh, for the proliferation of cancer cells. All right, Chris, a week ago you gave us uh, about, the, about the algae. Let's uh, just review a little bit. So give us an overview again of what you were working on. So I did research um, and was bombarded online and on the media by um, the adverse effects of climate change and global warming. And after a while, I got tired of hearing, we're doomed, we're doomed, and wanted to see what's being done to solve this. And one thing I found was uh, biofuel, which is, as I mentioned last week, a liquid um, fuel derived from the lipids produced by algae. Um, not only is this an efficient fuel like um, fossil fuels are, um, it's also clean. And unlike other clean energy sources like wind and solar power, it um, is a liquid fuel, so we don't need to alter um, the engines we already have, as we're doing, we have to do with electrical cars. Um, instead, uh, this could be used directly with a lot of the machinery we have today. Um, the issue is cost and efficiency. It right now costs too much to grow the algae in a photobioreactor. Um, and the algae itself it does produce a lot of lipid, but not efficiently enough to compete with fossil fuels. So I wanted to see one of the main causes of this, this lack of efficiency in this experiment. And in the past, when I looked at um, algal growth, uh, I tested a very common but very expensive growth aid that a lot of companies are using, which is aeration um, in their bioreactor. And I found that it was not actually as crucial to algal growth as a lot of companies um, assumed it to be, at least in my experiments. So going off of that, I wanted to see this year um, if I could increase the efficiency of the, the lipid production in the algae. And I wanted to test if a certain method of doing this, which is nitrogen deprivation, is all that it's hyped up to be. And nitrogen deprivation works where you grow your algae for a certain period of time, and then you take that algae and you transfer it into an environment with no nitrogen whatsoever. And without that nitrogen, the algae has to stop producing uh, proteins and shut down growth altogether, essentially. And without um, the proteins, all the carbon that the algae is given then has to go into uh, lipid production instead. The issue with that is it essentially takes twice as long to do and that hinders efficiency in itself and kind of negates the benefits you would get from making more lipids in the first place. So how long is the process? So the process can take, I, uh, for my trials, um, several months at a time. But in the in, um, biofuel industry, it does vary. But it can take um, anywhere between um, six months or a year or ideally less. To, to grow that algae for a growth period. So what do, you, what do you think, now that you have, have done this, do you think that there will be a way at some point in the future where it would be cost effective? Or you think that everything that you have seen and that you have done yourself says, that's probably going to be a dead end if we're looking for cost efficient fuel? Well, I tested a cheaper and um, a less time consuming method against nitrogen deprivation. Um, I did this by, I uh, made a, a 
um, photobioreactor, which is a fancy word for a bunch of bottles that I had kept in my mother's uh, bathroom. <laughs> and I grew um, algae um, uh, with groups with nitrogen deprivation and also groups where I increased the carbon that they were supplied. I increased the, the sodium bicarbonate that they were given. And I found that over several trials, the groups that had um, the increased carbon produced a very similar amount of lipid as the groups that had the nitrogen deprivation in about the same time. Um, so that indicates to me that we should definitely look into these more cost-effective methods because they clearly could uh, substitute for these uh, more expensive ones and possibly make biofuel globally accessible. Hmm. Who's, who's looking at this right now? Are all the energy companies looking at this? So right now, um, biofuel is most popular in uh, the United States and China. Um, China especially has very high uh, pollutant issues. And um, I think if, if anyone's going to, to really industrialize this, it would be the United States and China um, and, and startup companies in those countries. Chris, uh, now Evan had graduated now, but you're, you're going back to watch for your senior year, is that? That's right. Coming up. So are you going to, you'll be at, at Science uh, Fair again, you'll compete again? So I would like to look into that. I will be taking um, a lot of other courses, and I know that it won't be required for next year. But actually, that might be kind of a, a boon, because in the absence of all those uh, regulations and uh, due dates, I could actually mm. experiment maybe more and more freely. Um, and Listen, if I was, I don't know, if I was running the school, well, I just let, to agree to that. Yeah, I just let you do whatever you wanted. Just come in, do, set up your lab, and just do what I you want. I noticed he said he chose want. his mother's bathroom to set this up. Well, that was where the bottles, yeah, yeah. The, the bottles. <laughs> this year, I, I was able to move out of my mother's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but Evan, you, you competed uh, two years in a row, so, it, so it's possible to, to continue competing. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think it's, it's less common for seniors to take part in the fair. Um, but I definitely agree with what Chris said in terms of um, it's, it, w without having the, the really structured deadline, I think that you have a lot more freedom to kind of move at your own pace. I think that if you get behind, it can be a little more difficult to catch up. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's largely more like real science. W would you pursue the same, or would you uh, try something different? So I am very excited and largely invested with this field, but... After going to all these different fairs and seeing all these projects, uh, such a variety of them, um, I can't help but, but want to see well, where else, what else right. can I pursue, what else can I look into. Yeah, you had actually, last week you had talked about that, about meeting, uh, both of you had talked about some of that, you know, you, you meet some other people, but you talked about some of the other people that you had, had met and made contact with and some of the things that they were, were doing. T tell us a little bit about that, some of the things that you, so that you might want to, to do in the future then with this. Well, um, like I mentioned, um, there was a student who was working with a completely different organism uh, to, to produce biofuel, which was, was a type of yeast. And that was sort of reminding me that just because algae works doesn't mean other things don't work. And it's very important in such a new field not to be narrow-minded. And that's exactly what I was hoping to pursue in my experiments, to, to s challenge what is accepted because we haven't had enough time, I don't think, to really do enough experiments um, to compare different variables and find different paths. Uh, and the science fair was a great demonstration of that. Well, for, for younger kids who are interested in science, what would you recommend them do? Uh, always, you know, over the summers or in school, what kind of classes or interests in, on YouTube? What channels? What would you recommend they pursue and entertain themselves with for their interests? So. I think a very important aspect of it is to be surrounded by people who are very enthusiastic about science. At our school, we have uh, the science seminar, which um, was every, every Tuesday, we would go and there would be these, these scientists and teachers that would help us with our project and take an interest in what we were doing. And for, for younger students, I think that's very important to go to, whether it's a different camp, or um, a class that allows them to really be hands-on and interactive um, and expose them to that at an early age, uh, that is definitely crucial to um, advancing in science and getting into science. Well, you really what would give you it say? To yeah. for what would you say, it. Evan? What's your advice to the kids? 
I'd say just pick something you love. I mean, I think that whatever you're doing, if you're going to be spending a lot of time with it, it's a lot easier to put a tremendous amount of effort into something if you really enjoy what you're doing. Um, I think that especially given that um, inquiry-based science is involved, or there's a lot of failure involved with inquiry-based science, I think that it's really important that you love, love what you do. Um, because I think that'll help you kind of stick with it more. As what Chris was saying failures. is more or less what the STEM program or STEAM programs that have recently come about. I'm sure when you guys were younger, this was probably not available. But now they've been doing this more initiative of a STEAM type of program with that hands-on, more exploratory, science-based curriculums in, in like elementary and middle mm -hmm. schools. And do you know much about that? And if so, like what would you say to that? So I, I think it's brilliant. I have been, been looking into uh, what they're doing with STEM and now STEAM. I think it's fantastic that they incorporated uh, the arts into that. And I completely agree with what Evan was saying. Um, kids should be able to follow what they enjoy because that is how they would be most productive. If you enjoy something, you put more effort into it and you can do more. And I think for a lot of years, many students were not given those opportunities and weren't able to pursue their dreams, essentially. And now I think people are starting to realize that we can give uh, right. students those opportunities. Right. Mm -hmm. what, what are you doing when you aren't, just because of what, what you just said about STEAM and adding the arts <laughs> in with the science and the technology and the engineering and the math. So when you're not you know, dissecting the fruit flies, what do you, what are you <laughs> what doing? What do you do on your free time? Um, yeah, so I, I think that um, being involved in other things is definitely great to have an outlet. So I play tennis for the school as well. Or I played tennis, it's weird to say. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so uh, tennis, and then I also um, play the trombone and piano also. Um, and then, yeah, and then I just try to spend as much time with like, my little sister as possible. Yeah, yeah. How about you? Well, um, I love to draw. I love to, um, over absolutely everything, all my schoolwork is covered. Um, but I also, I'm in, the, I'm in the Boy Scouts, so I'm, every month I go camping with the, with the troop. And um, it's... it's very important to me to have that, that connection to nature um, and very inspirational as well. Yeah, it's interesting that you both kind of had different paths to come to uh, your, your love of science. You really threw nature and somehow seeing that connection from the great outdoors to then being able to be in the lab or I guess actually being outside with algae or some other things that you will be involved in. And you just, I don't know, it seems like maybe a, a different path, not so much the connection to the outdoors is just sort of the, you know, the experimentation and the insights, but just uh, always even from an early age wanting to, to, to help people. And it seemed as if maybe early on, maybe even wanting to pursue some sort of a medical uh, career or something. Yeah, that's definitely been the debate over the course of my high school career is whether I wanted to actually practice medicine or, or stick with basic research. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. You still have time to change your mind. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. <laughs> Listen, we, have, we, we, we do have a, a, a few minutes, uh, but we do want to, to, to wrap up. What else do we sort of need to know? Uh, we have two great representatives, but obviously, you know, I mean, 70 young people from Wachusett. I just can't tell you how impressed I am with Wachusett for making available these scientists, these teachers, for what is, is being done. I, I mean, maybe this is being done in a lot of, of other high schools, but I really think Wachusett may be fairly unique. Well, I think in what it's extremely doing. unique, and I think both of you can maybe spend a minute talking about this. Uh, Wachusett has struggled a lot with their budget, but even with that struggle, the, the especially all the teachers, but especially the science teachers, have done a great job with the limited material and the limited budget that they were given. If you could just enlighten us of what your experience has been uh, in that kind of situation. Well. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe uh, Wachusett is um, one of the only, if the only high school that does um, science seminar in our area. Mm -hmm. And that is run by teachers who don't get uh, paid overtime. They do it because they have a passion for teaching and for helping students to excel and pursue what they would like to, to pursue. And I am astounded by um, how devoted they are to their schools and um, would definitely back them to be, to be aided um, economically and otherwise in, in this. Kevin? Yeah, you mentioned the struggle with the budget earlier. I think that the amount that they accomplish and um, you know, the work that, that comes out of what you said, given um, what they have to work with uh, financially, is, is really remarkable. The teachers there are, I've always said since freshman year, I think you know, among the best in the state in terms of um, 
the time that they put in and, and how accessible they are. Um, we mentioned Mr. Guerin earlier. I'm constantly asking him annoying questions at all hours of the night, and he's always receptive. Um, and so I just don't know where else you'd really find that. I'm just so thankful. All right, so you're wearing your school committee hat now. So how, how is Wachusett doing it? I mean, is it, is it this all is the volunteer? This is first year in many years that we have all five towns have passed the budget this year. Mm -hmm. So that's an excellent indication so is of there, moving up. Uh, is there a budget line for this program? Or no, this no. Pro this so this program, program is, is all volunteer? completely all volunteer. That is, uh, that is incredible. That, that's fantastic. Makes it even more... Right. More impressive. Community, All the work teachers, from the students, professors, from and everybody. students. Yeah. Yeah. Coming, Show uh, coming up Tuesday together. nights. And, Give and, up their Tuesday and nights. And these Tuesday nights, the scientists who are coming, are they, are they coming from WPI and other UMass, schools, WPI, yeah? different colleges, teachers, um, even sometimes parents who oh, them, may too. have a particular right. expertise but working for a different company. Uh, may volunteer. Well, I can't believe this has brought us to the end of a, another show, so I'll ask my time for your perspective, and, and congratulations again, guys. Really uh, fantastic yeah. Thank work. you for joining us again uh, for our second week and giving us more details on your project. Uh, for ending from my perspective, um, this show really was a little bit for my sake because I was interested in exactly the details of their project. So full disclosure, I am a software engineer. I you know, had to debate between going into genomes and genetics and DNA and RNA, because that was my interest too. But then I decided to go to computer science, uh, went to WPI. But this kind of science fair and these kind of things have always interested me. So part of this show was a little bit my, my reasoning for my interest. But what a great um, time listening to these young adults that are moving on into, in their lives for new and better things. And I am looking forward to see what else they can do in the future. And hopefully you will join us again. Uh, with Thanks your work in the future and what you guys are up to. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you.